Thank you for joining us on At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. I'm very pleased to have here at the table Darren LaHood, who is the newly elected congressman for the 18th Congressional District. Congratulations. Thank you, H. Great to be with you and your viewers. And I should point out to uh, the viewers that, in case you don't know the geography, from the Mississippi River across to Sangamon County, up to McLean County, includes a little bit of Bloomington. Correct. Up to Marshall and Stark. That's correct. How 19 many? counties. 19 counties, all are parts of That's correct. 19 counties. Windshield time, we call that, right? <laughs> yes, it is. A lot, lot of windshield time. We have a lot of topics to get to, so uh, let's, uh, uh, we've already said congratulations. Let's get to the serious topics that you're going to face uh, now that, and you have been, um, uh, you, you're a congressman, no longer congressman-elect, so you're facing issues such as, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about government reform, because you campaigned on government reform what do you mean by that? Well, uh, in the state Senate, uh, I was very proud of a record there on standing up for ethics and transparency and shedding more light on government. Um, and, you know, when you look at state government, how do we make it more effective, efficient, and accountable? Uh, and, and I think there's lots of ways at the federal government we can do that, particularly when we're looking at an $18 trillion debt that's almost at $19 trillion and how we reform government. You know, on the, on the campaign side of things, I've talked an awful lot about, um, you know, more disclosure when it comes to campaign donations, uh, particularly on super PACs and some of these other shadowy groups there. You know, I'm a big believer that you should be able to give the amount of money that you want under our legal system, but there needs to be transparency to find out where the money's coming from so that people can get online and almost Google uh, a, a congressman or an elected official and find out where their money came from, who gave that money. I think that's important for uh, the people to know that, the taxpayers to know that, uh, citizens to know that. Trimming government costs, where? Well, I, I think, you know, if you look at, whether it's state government or federal government, when you look at, you know, uh, the amount of money that's spent there, uh, anything can be made more effective and efficient and accountable. For instance, I'll give you an example. The Department of Homeland Security just did an Inspector General report. There's 55,000 cars that Homeland Security has. Now, how do you, you know, take those cars? And what this report said is they could save about $400 million a year uh, by outsourcing some of that, using contracts for some of that, using different um, you know, resources uh, with those particular cars. That's one small example. I mean, I think there's, when you look at the federal government, how large it is, you know, we have to be able to do kind of like private sector does, you know, to efficiently cut back when you need to, uh, streamline things when you need to. Um, you know, the Department of Veterans Affairs, a year ago, we had one of the biggest scandals. Today, there's been one person fired. You know, why is the, the changes that we need for our veterans, why has that not happened? So, I mean, I, I think there's lots of areas where we can cut back, reform and do it, and also look at the private sector. Um, again, Department of Homeland Security, there was a under, uh, kind of an undercover uh, um, fraud scam that they did where they, they uh, let in about, uh, I think it was almost 90% of the guns got through the metal detectors. So what came out of that report is, what if we gave that to the private sector? Save money with taxpayer money, did let the private sector do that. So I think there's lots of areas to look at in government, in the military also, some of our procurement. Um, obviously I'm just coming into the job, but I, I guess I start off with the premise, e making government more effective, efficient, and accountable to taxpayers. That's on the expense side. How about the income side and tax reform? Do you take a particular position on tax reform? Well, I think you got to simplify it. Uh, the tax code is too arcane in some uh, ways, uh, very, very complicated, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses and for individuals. So streamlining that process, I think, uh, making it less, um, you know, cumbersome. Uh, you know, it's the biggest complaint that small businesses talk about. And, and so reforming the tax code to make it easier. A flat tax? You have a, a position on that yet? I, I um, have not looked at the proposals put forth, introduced in legislation, but in general, yes, I think that's uh, something I would look at. In terms of uh, expenses, again, uh, the Affordable Care Act, the name is Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Has the Affordable Care Act, in your opinion, done what it was meant to do? Are there some successes in it? And would you repeal it or would you 
look at a different way of dealing with the Affordable Care Act? Well, um, uh, in general, I'm not supportive of the federal government, you know, doing what they've done and taking over health care. However, you look at close to 10 million people are now signed up on it. Um, you know, there's some facets of the Affordable Care Act that I think, um, you know, I would want to retain in whatever reforms that we do. I think keeping children on their parents' health care until age 25 or 26 is good. I think the provisions that pertain to pre-existing conditions is good. But when you look at, you know, you're basically taking about one-sixth of the economy and turning that over to the federal government and having them run it through the subsidy program, you know, I'm generally not in favor of that. I think, you know, more market-based ideas, more of the private sector involved. You know, for instance, having uh, the ability to go across state lines when it comes to insurance. I think that's another reform. So I think there's lots of different reforms, amendments, and changes we can make to have less of the federal government involved but still provide service uh, and a good patient-doctor uh, relationship uh, has to be there. Let's stay on the expense question. On January 25th of last year, according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, 50.1%, one half of all federal inmates were drug offenders. Mm -hmm. Now, not all of those were for minor drug offenses. Some were for serious things, but many of those are for minor drug offenses involving marijuana. Do you have a particular stance on marijuana on the federal level? We've got a federal law that says that what Colorado is doing is a no-no. Where do you stand on that, considering that half of the inmates in federal prisons are in for drug offenses, and that's costing a lot of money? And that's up from 16% in 1970. Um, well, having spent time as a state and federal prosecutor, I've prosecuted a lot of narcotics cases in my time as a prosecutor. When you look at our prison system, and whether it's the state level or the federal level, as you just referenced, um, first of all, I'm not supportive of legalizing marijuana or making it recreational. I think w the effect that it has on young people's minds uh, is statistically is, is proven to be, you know, it, it distorts uh, and, it, and it hurts brain cells with young people. And, and also, um, the evidence is very clear that marijuana is a gateway drug to um, you know, uh, more potent drugs, whether that's cocaine or methamphetamine or heroin. So I, I don't believe that uh, recreational or criminalizing or decriminalizing marijuana is the route to go. Having said that, I also believe in the Tenth Amendment that states are kind of the laboratory of democracies. What Colorado does or California does or Massachusetts does, they should have the right to do that under their democratic system. To your point about prisons, um, what I am supportive of, Governor Rauner has put forth a uh, criminal justice reform task force. And what that's looked at is, you know, our prisons are full of a lot of drug offenders. How can we look at those offenders that are in prison that are in there for nonviolent offenses? Drug offenses, for instance. Uh, offenses where if they got the proper treatment, uh, if they got the proper counseling, they could come out and be a productive member of our society. Um, you know, the Rauner proposal on the criminal justice reform, which I'm supportive of, talks about reducing the Illinois prison population by 25% over four years. I'm supportive of looking at those ideas. But the bottom line is the public safety of our communities, of our families, have to come first and foremost. But there's no doubt warehousing people in prison over a long period of time, particularly for nonviolent offenses, is, is not a good recipe for reforming uh, individuals in prison or, you know, rehabilitating them. Looking at that same survey, 10.6 percent of federal inmates, again this is on the federal level, are in for immigration violations. I don't know the mix. Some of those are serious, some are not mm -hmm. so serious, but there we go. One out of ten are in prison because of federal uh, immigration violations. What is your stance with regard to the fact that President Obama has uh, exercised executive amnesty, and would you stand with the leadership in Congress uh, to say there will be no immigration reform because of that? Well, um, as a federal prosecutor, I've actually been in federal courtroom and prosecuted immigration cases. I've sent people back to their country of origin as a prosecutor. I, I know that system fairly well. And I would just say we have laws on the books for a reason. Um, and you have to stand up for the rule of law. So I, I think I start off with um, a couple foundational things. 
First, you have to secure the border, uh, particularly our southern border, to deter people from continuing to come across our border. Um, and secondly, you've got to stand up for the rule of law. If you don't like the laws on the books, then let's change them. Let's have a debate about that at the federal level. But, but there's clear laws on the books. I am supportive of streamlining the legal immigration process. Right now, the legal immigration process can take anywhere from four to seven years. That's way too long. Um, I've participated in naturalization services at the federal courthouse. There is no more patriotic ceremony than going to one of those where you see people that played by the rules, right? They did everything we asked them to do. They went back to their country of origin in some cases. They paid the appropriate amounts. They did the background check. They come here legally. They go and take that oath, and they turn out to be our best citizens. Streamlining that process, not from four to seven years, but we should easily be able to do that in one or two years and make that easier for people to come here legally. I'm very supportive of that. I'm not supportive of amnesty. I think uh, it's fundamentally unfair to take people that broke the law and put them at the front of the line or equal with people that played by the rules. You mentioned strengthening the borders. How would you strengthen the borders? Well, I'm, I'm not in favor of a wall. I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think the wall is easy to get around. If you look at uh, El Chapo, what he did a tunnel for a, a mile un, under a prison. So I think there's lots of ways. But I do think with the technology we have, particularly with our military, some of our intelligence services, using that technology to put along the border. I think if you talk to Border Patrol agents, you need some more resources, you need more Border Patrol. But clearly, I mean, uh, America is a can-do country. We can solve this problem. It is going to take some resources, take some energy and some uh, innovativeness, but we can clearly do that. You're, you campaigned as a conservative. The U.S. Chamber in the primary supported you, touting your conservative uh, point of view. Uh, do, does your conservative viewpoint proper, because you are a representative of the people, does your position equate to that of the 18th Congressional District? Uh, when you vote in Congress, do you vote as Darren LaHood or do you vote as the representative of your district? Well, first of all, I just ran in two elections, in a primary in July and another one in September. I was proud to get almost 70% in both of those and ran as a proud conservative and as a proud Republican on the issues that I feel strongly about. You know, we talked a lot about, you know, smaller government, uh, fiscal responsibility, term limits, ethics and transparency. Those are the issues we ran on and we're proud of the plurality we got. I mean, it's a conservative district that, that I currently represent, and I'm honored to represent the people in this district. Um, you know, in many ways, it's a rural district. Uh, but uh, as I go to Congress, I'm going to continue to have those same values that I had in the state Senate, uh, whether it's, you know, um, trying to promote a stronger economy, more jobs, more opportunities. You know, but, but those are the, the values that I have. And when I take a vote, obviously, I take into account my constituency, but also the values that I have. How much influence might the leadership in Congress, John Boehner, et cetera, have in you making a decision as to how you vote on a particular issue? Well, first and foremost for me, it's going to be my district and where I stand on issues. I represent the 18th district, the 710,000 people in this district. That's the foundation for how I make decisions on, on accurately reflecting and voting for my district. You mentioned term limits. Are you in favor of term limits? If so, how many? Yeah, so in the state Senate, I've been the chief sponsor of term limits for 10 years for state legislators in the state House and the state Senate. Now that I'm moving on to the federal level, what I've said is every member of Congress should serve uh, three terms, uh, but you're not going to get everybody to comply with that, uh, to do that. So what I've said is there's, there's a fine line between being a career politician, staying there too long, and, and then staying at too short of amount of time and not being effective. What I've said is there is a happy medium. I think somewhere between four and eight terms is appropriate amount to go out there, be effective, uh, and then come back to your district. Let's talk about some, let, let's go beyond the border and talk uh, about the authorization of military force to combat ISIS in Syria, in Iraq. Uh, do you see boots on the ground? What kind of military force might you support in fighting ISIS? Well, in looking back, I think it was a real mistake uh, to pull our bases and troops out of Iraq. And, and I know the, the president at the time ran on that. But if you look at what happened, we, our military, our Marines, our army, they secured Iraq. And they did it with a lot of blood and treasure and lives. 
But they secured Iraq, had bases in place, and then once we made the decision to pull out, the Iraqi army vaporized, and it was the rise of ISIS. And when I hear the president early on say that ISIS is kind of the JV team to Al-Qaeda, I mean, clearly that was wrong. Um, and I think we miss, uh, miss the boat on that in terms of, you know, characterizing them for who they are. Clearly, ISIS is a force that continues to grow in Syria, now in Iraq. Uh, they're spreading to other places. Um, and, and they are barbaric in, in, their, in their brutality of what they've been doing, particularly to Christians in the Middle East, uh, but also to Muslims too. They have to be stopped. And I would say a couple of things. We have to fully support our military, our drones, our intelligence services over there. We have to get our allies to take some ownership in this. Um, we have to train an alternative force in Syria to go in there. I think all those things. What I worry about is what happens if Baghdad goes down or a number of these other cities. Clearly it was a mistake. None of this would have happened if our military and our base was in, were in place. I'm not talking about being engaged in military conflict. Remember, H, every military conflict that the U.S. has been successful in over the last hundred years, we've kept a presence there. We, we still have bases in Japan, in Germany. The reason why we don't hear anything about uh, what happened in Bosnia is we have a force there, peacekeepers in place. you got to keep forces in place to secure the peace. We did not do that here. Uh, Secretary of State Kerry uh, came back with an agreement on the nuclear deal with Iran. Have you had time to look at any of that? That's a rather lengthy agreement. Uh, and how do you feel about that particular agreement? Um, I have not read the agreement. Uh, I have gotten a copy and I plan to do that as with everything that uh, I'll have an opportunity to vote on. Um, I, I, I guess I start off by a couple things that come to mind. Um, for 25 years, Iran has been non-compliant, um, refused to follow rules, protocols, sanctions that have been put in place, not by the United States, by the United Nations, by the EU, by lots of other entities. So they've been blatantly untrustworthy with everything that's been put in front of them. So with that track record, it's hard for me to believe that now they are gonna be trustworthy and we can, we can believe in what they tell us in this agreement. I think the second thing is, you know, um, they talk about this is gonna to lead to democracy in Iran, that's some of the thought. I mean, remember, they're a religious theocracy. They have a supreme leader that makes every decision in the country. That supreme leader is a re religious zealot who wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, continually talks about death to America, wants to eliminate kind of the values and morals that we stand for. Uh, and so, I, again, those two things are very troubling uh, to trust a regime that, that the reality is those two things that I mentioned. And so I would have a hard time supporting this agreement or going forward, I think it's gonna in some ways make us more unsafe. What I would like to change about it is to have 24 seven monitoring of the Iranians. That's what we need in here, having 24 seven monitors, at least for the first 10 years, to make sure that we're sufficiently satisfied they're not engaged in this type of activity. That's not in this agreement. Let's move a little bit north of there to Russia. Um, President Putin has, um, uh, I think it's pretty clear our, our intelligence shows that he is supporting the rebels in uh, Ukraine, uh, Crimea, now in Belarus. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a, su a suggestion on how America might deal with President Putin? Well, uh, you know, I think you got to be careful about making promises you can't keep. And what I mean by that is, if you remember when Putin and Russia, a year ago, year and a half, were thinking about going into Ukraine or Crimea. Crimea. They said, uh, our president said, well, there's going to be consequences if you did that. Well, he did it, and there were real no consequences that came about. And so I think you got to be careful when you put America's, you know, word up there and you put, uh, you know, a statement out there, you got to be able to stand up to it. And we haven't been able to stand up to him in Ukraine or Crimea. So I think those are... Uh, I think it's important that, that you know, w when you take a stand, you, you got to stand up because that's America's, you know, that's, that's our word, that's our, um, you know, that's us as a country and our military taking a stand. Stand up in what way? Well, I, I think you got to send a message that you can't go into countries that are democracies or heading towards 
um, you know, freedom and capitalism away from kind of the Russian way of life. And they're looking to the West for help. And we've kind of been there for them. But, you know, when, when Putin went in there and kind of put his stamp on there, we kind of evaporated. We weren't there. And so um, I, I think you got to be very careful about making statements that you can't stand up to. Uh, coming back to uh, America, uh, Planned Parenthood um, inserted foot in mouth. And of course, we all know that Planned Parenthood does a lot of different things. It's not just the ones that make headlines. Do you feel that the federal government should defund Planned Parenthood? And if so, what would you suggest that the government do to make up the difference for prenatal care and things of that nature that Planned Parenthood is doing? Well, first of all, the allegations of what has come forth with these videos with Planned Parenthood are very, very troubling. And I've, I've watched a few of them. I mean, they are barbaric in some respects that the harvesting of body parts to for people to profit from is what the allegations are here. And what I've said is there needs to be a full investigation into uh, these very, very troubling videos. And people need to be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. But to think in 2015 this kind of activity is allegedly going on, again, I think is um, you know, uh, barbaric and, and needs to be stopped. So I am supportive of defunding Planned Parenthood uh, if they're engaged in these kind of activities. Um, I, I don't think we should be spending taxpayer money. To your point, there are, particularly here in Illinois, there are many health care clinics for women throughout the state of Illinois that provide all of these services that Planned Parenthood does also. That money should be taken away from Planned Parenthood and given to these other health care clinics that do a wonderful job right here in central Illinois and all over this congressional district. If that's the kind of activity they're engaged in, then there should be consequences to that, and I'm supportive of those consequences. You believe in the definition of marriage being one man, one woman, the sanctity of marriage. Uh, there are those who suggest that there should be a constitutional amendment to, to define that as marriage as one man, one woman. What's the likelihood of an amendment actually coming to fruition? And if that is not the case, uh, how, how do you address the LGBT community with regard to your position on one man, one woman marriage? Well, I'm a, I'm a strong practicing Catholic, I believe, based on my religion and just personally, the sanctity of marriage is between one man and one woman. In the state senate, I voted for, um, I voted against the gay marriage bill that came forth. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, again, going back to the Tenth Amendment, I'm a big believer that states should be able to decide this issue. And, you know, I may not like what Illinois does with gay marriage or what Colorado or California or other states do, but I believe the states should be entitled to do that, um, and, and, uh, and that should be the right of, of every state to decide what they want to do, and I think it's more of a states' rights issue. Let's turn to the Second Amendment. You support the Second Amendment, the concealed carry, things of that nature. Uh, we've had a lot of um, massacres, I'll use that term, uh, way too many, one's too many. Um, you have said, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've said that you believe that we should enforce the laws that are already on the books. But should we look more closely at mental health and background checks going further than just the, the books, the laws that are on the books? A couple things. I mean, my heart goes out to the families and victims of these tragedies that have gone on far too often over the last year and a half or two years. The most recent one with the TV reporter in Virginia. Absolutely tragic. In almost all of those instances, you mentioned background checks, wouldn't have prevented what went on here, uh, depending on how that law was structured or the proposal of that. So the background check wouldn't have prevented uh, many of those. Um, we have lots of laws on the books on the state level and the federal level when it comes to uh, gun laws. Um, and, and I think those are sufficient now, particularly if they're enforced. At the federal level, if you're a convicted felon, or you've been convicted of domestic battery, or you have mental illness, you cannot possess a weapon. That is not fully enforced at the federal level. Now, maybe we don't have the resources to do that, but the U.S. Attorney's Office or the federal government is not enforcing those. Those need to be enforced. I absolutely believe that taxpayer money should be used for mental illness. If you look at many of these shooters in these instances, they had 
mental, mental illness, they had issues, they had real deficiencies, uh, and, and getting money to those type of people, I'm absolutely supportive of. And with that, the half hour has expired, and there are so many more issues to talk about, but we'll have you back on, is that all right? That'd be great, H, thank you. Congratulations again, and thank welcome you. to the United States Congress, Darren LaHood. Thank you, H. And we'll be back next week with another edition of that issue when we're going to be talking to four doctors, that's PhD people, at the USDA lab here in Peoria, talking about the successes they've had over their 75 years of history. Join us for the next At Issue.